All right, here we are. Uh, good afternoon to all and welcome to seminar 14 of year two of our Maximo seminar. We are in the ambiguum, <clears throat> the ambiguous still, volume two. Today we are looking at ambigua 37 through 41, ambigua 37 through 41, which is pages 73 through 121 in the uh, in volume two. Now, <clears throat> the themes, uh, such as may, may be discerned, the themes are uh, ecstasis, ecstasis is the first, and then a double mode, what Maximus calls a double mode, ecstasis and a double mode, and then the phrase mode of completion. Maximus uses the phrase mode of completion. And finally, the gift. So the themes are, are ecstasy, the idea of a double mode, the idea of a mode of completion, and then the idea of, of the gift or a gift. Now, <clears throat> pardon me. Last time, in the last passages we looked at, we saw how the incarnation of the Logos brings about, brought about, brings about a marvelous union, Maximus says, according to hypostasis. This is just on page 70, 170, pardon me, 73, right before the passage we're looking at today. Movement within this hypostatic union, this hypostatic union, which means personhood, movement within this hypostatic union is ecstatic. It partakes of a double mode, um, Maximus says. The height of which, this ecstatic or double mode, the height of which Maximus calls our mode of completion of the gift of life. Our mode of completion of the gift of life. So he's talking about, about ways of being, as it were, habits of mind, as it were. <clears throat> so beginning with Ambiguum 73, uh, 37, rather. On page 73. One minute. <clears throat> the bottom of 73, it's just to read out Gregory's passage. <clears throat> this is from Gregory's sermon on the Nativity. Gregory says, Now then, receive, receive together with me the conception of Christ and leap before him with joy, leap before him for joy. If not like John in the womb, then at least like David at the repose of the ark. Again, now then receive together with me the conception of Christ and leap before him for joy. If not like John in the womb, then at least like David at the repose of the ark. Right. Leaping for joy. One's whole person is immediately involved here. One's entire being. Right. We respond energetically to the presence or the drawing near of Christ. Right. Now, this, this leaping for joy um, in, in John in the womb, at David at the repose of the ark. The gospel begins with glad tidings of great joy as it says. And the gospel ends, at least uh, the, the Luke's uh, narrative, ends with the disciples return to Jerusalem filled with great joy. Great joy is, the, uh, is our response to, to, to the presence of Christ. And joy draws us up and out of ourselves unto others. It's ecstatic. It draws us up and out of it. It, it wells up within it. It takes us beyond ourselves. Now, not to read out, but over pages 75, page 77, Maximus begins to, to speak in terms of um, John and David as images, images of repentance or images of confession, or types, types of virtues, types of virtues, and also as symbols. 
right? He walks through a number of qualities and points to indicate, rather, how the leaping of, of David or John or, or just their figure relates to these, these ideas we have, the, these this sense of, of meaning we have. And just to distinguish here between symbol, type, and image for a moment, symbol, type, and image, it seems to me that that here symbol means to it, well it means for us to draw together it, it concentrates it converges it converges unto a concept right so the symbol the drawing together type type is odd we can think of it as as a as a print um like a like a typeset also archetype comes from there type here or, or in general in our tradition means a, a temporal iteration of a truth which is beyond time a temporal iteration of an eternal truth so we say this is a type of christ or this is a type of the church right? type means an historical impression something that presses in in time so it's 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 bound with history and there and therefore therefore with the activity of the Holy Spirit. But it's a temporal notion. An image here, we remember that image does not mean echo or representation for Maximus at this point. It means more like model. So if we say uh, John is the image of this, John is the model of this, not not a not a recasting of it, but it's very um showing forth. One term in particular to focus on, and it's on um, it's it's translated as a phrase in English. It's on page seventy five and seventy seven. On page seventy five, it's about six lines down, where it says the great John, he is also a symbol. About six lines down on page seventy five, a symbol of the unchanging habit of mind. Right, that's the term, unchanging habit of mind. Right. The term is repeated on, on page 77, about midway through, uh, midway through the first paragraph, when he says, that is either like the great John, through a habit of mind that remains unchained from the beginning to the end, etc, etc, etc. He he continues to relate that. Now, uh, this, this intrigued me because i thought ah habit of mind it's like a, a cast of mind or it might mean um practical wisdom something like that the word is in 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 the text is axiom uh, its root is axis and it's a very difficult word to find it, it has its 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 roots in in um pre pre-christian at, at least a uh, greek philosophical language and it means something like a permanent state of being, or as it is translated here, an unchangeable habit of mind. It's in Liddell's uh, lex uh, lexicon, Liddell's Greek English. It's not in other dictionaries, surprisingly. But it also states that this this axis or axine, this unchanging habit of mind, is, as it were, an unchanging result of praxis. An, an unchanging result of practical of the practical effort. So this habit of mind is, as it were, the 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 the, the wholeness of our ascetic struggle bearing fruit. Or another way of putting it, this this exine, this unchanging habit of mind is the completion of our mind by our body. Our body has labored. It's the labor of the body finding its completion in this habit of mind. It's a very curious. It, the word recurs. It's distinguished, or Liddell distinguishes it uh, with schesis. Uh, we saw schesis. It's on, if we want the reference, it's on page 355 uh, as an end note. Um, Schesis meaning relation or condition. So axis is different than relation or condition. That This habit of mind is not a condition in that sense. It's also distinguished from uh, dynamis, 
or, or dynamic uh, energy. So this unchanging habit of mind also doesn't involve a movement, uh, strictly speaking. The completion of our mind by our body. Now, this idea of a habit of mind or or um, or, or a, a permanent way of being <clears throat> brings us into one of Maximus's most curious ideas here. The, the, so, so these are ideas which stretch over kind of pages seventy-seven through eighty-five. We'll read some passages from them, but we're we're kind of holding the next seven, eight pages in mind. This habit of mind, this habit of mind, which is an unchanging result of our work, which changes. So it partakes of both what changes and what doesn't change. What changes and what doesn't change. Which means that that it is a fusion of temporal and atemporal horizons. This habit of mind is a fusion of temporal and atemporal horizons. So one is in time, and yet one is beyond time. One is in history, and yet one is partaking of truth beyond history, as it were. Mm. Excuse me, just one. Mm. Maximus calls this a double mode, a double mode. And by this he means, and we're still just page 77 and following on the next couple of pages. By this he's meaning to point to our synergetic being. The double mode points to our synergetic being, synergy, remember, synergy, energy together. Or our personhood, personhood in the Orthodox tradition is understood as a being in relation. It's a being as communion, being in relation. This double mode also can be seen as the concentration of, uh, of, of immanence and transcendence. We see this clearly in, in, in Christ, echoing in us. And the double mode also means that the clearest of truths, the simplest of truths, becomes a great mystery. Say, the person in front of us both is and is embraceable and yet completely fathomless. So the double mode of, of or the double habit of mind, maybe even, but the double mode, which is linked with the habit of mind, means we're capable of loving God in man for example, or the person as divine. We're capable of holding those horizons together. Now, just to read a bit, turn to 79, please. 79. We'll read the beginning of the full paragraph midway through, just over the page, and then we'll skip a page and read... Um, from 83. So 79, beginning with, for according to those who study these mysteries. He's going to introduce the, the kind of um, work that goes into this idea of double mode. For according to those who study these mysteries with precision, and the lovers and devoted visionaries of the spiritual principles that pertain to them, the general principle of spiritual contemplation, though it happens to be one, is seen to expand in a tenfold manner, by place, time, genus, person, rank, or occupation, by practical, natural, and theological philosophy, by present and by future, that is, by type and truth, historical present, he means there, type. When, on the other hand, this principle is contracted, the first five modes are reduced to three, and the three to two, and the two are completely enfolded in the one principle that is not in any way susceptible of numeration. For example, the five modes of place, time, 
genus, person, and rank, are contracted into the second three, namely the modes of practical, natural, and theological philosophy. And these three in turn are united with the next two, which signify present and future. And these last two are gathered, <clears throat> these last two are gathered into the perfecting and simple, as they say, I like that qualification, as they say, this is unknowable, the perfecting and simple and ineffable inner principle, logos, that contains them all, from which the universal set of ten modes for the contemplation of scripture comes forth in procession, and to which they return, for therein lies its origin as a tenfold reality, being gathered up in an ascending movement through contraction back into a monad. All right, hold that in mind, and then just turn the page over to uh, page 83, the beginning of the first full paragraph, just that paragraph. For all these things, which our discussion has shown to be contained within the five modes, are, in their primary divisions, constituted of substance, potency, and activity, whether they move or are moved, or whether they are acted on or act or whether they contemplate or are contemplated, whether they speak or are spoken, whether they teach or are <clears throat> taught, whether they call for acceptance or rejection, and simply, to speak concisely, whether in an active or in a passive manner they introduce us to practical, natural, and theological philosophy by means of their variegated combination with one another. To be sure, each of the things we have named can be understood under various modes, through concepts about it, gathered through contemplation. In a way that neither, sorry, in a way that denotes either praise or blame, and it manifests the principles that pertain to it, whether these should be practiced or avoided, whether they are natural or unnatural, intelligible or unintelligible. For, as I have said, there is a double mode for each item, according to the capacity of the person who undertakes an intelligent examination of their respective contemplation. Through, then, the affirmation of those principles that are practicable, natural, and intelligible, and the negation of those that are not to be practiced, are unnatural, and are mere mindless imaginings, the pious will attain to practical, natural and theological philosophy, which is the same as saying the love of God. But Maximus walked us around the entire park to bring us back to the centerpiece and say, here it is. One distinguishes in order to confirm integrity. One distinguishes in order to point to how things belong together. And a double mode, a double mode of perception allows us to, to see things using the word as, you know, see it as, to see a person as divine, to see this as good. In other words, to move between concrete certainty and, and abstract, uh, abstract fancy. We don't need to just linger with the absolutely concrete, nor go into complete fantasy. It's the synergy between the two of them. And in this way, our, our, our double mode or a double mode of thinking allows us to think in terms of likeness or even in terms of in terms of or to think as if or according to. It's the beginning of relation. All right. This double mode uh, translates into an appropriate mode for, for Maximus. Um, following on... Yeah, just following on, on from that passage. So page 85, near the very top, we'll read... A couple of pages until the end of the uh, ambiguum. All right. 
And these three modes of philosophy are further divided into present and future. For like a shadow, they stand in relation to truth, type, and archetype. That man is able, in this present age, in a manner that is lofty and beyond nature, beyond nature, to reach the most extreme measure of virtue and knowledge and wisdom, and attain the science of divine realities, is something that occurs through the types and images of the archetypes. This is because everything that is now reckoned by us to be a truth, everything that is now reckoned by us to be a truth, is in fact a type, and the shadow and the image of the greater word. For the word who created all things and who is in all things, according to the according to the relation of the present to the future, is comprehended both in type and truth, both in type and truth, he's comprehended, in which he is present both in being, truth, and manifestation, type. And yet he is manifested in absolutely nothing, for inasmuch as he transcends the present and the future, he transcends both type and truth, for he contains nothing that might be considered contrary to him. But truth has a contrary, falsehood. Therefore, the word in whom the universe is gathered transcends the truth. The Logos transcends the truth. And also, insofar as he is man and God, he truly transcends all humanity and divinity. That's one I, th I, I think, I don't know, but I think that's one of the central passages in Maximus. Therefore, the first five modes, through the multiform contemplation to which they are subject, are gathered together into practical, natural, and theological philosophy, and these three are further gathered into the modes of present and future, that is, type and truth. Present and future, in turn, are gathered up in the beginning, that is, in the word who is in the beginning, who enables the worthy, so the subject now is the worthy, to experience and to see him. For in the manner described above, they diligently pursued their course to him. For And it was for him that they transformed into a monad what for their sakes had become a decad, which expelled them from every impassioned movement, whether natural or, intelle or intellectual, and which by divine grace formed within them throughout their whole habit of mind, there's the word again, exeunt, the quality of simplicity that is natural to the divine. We should also know this. The principles of providence and judgment have been planted within natural and practical philosophy, respectively, consistent with the modes that are proper to them, and they come to light through the contemplation both of beings and of things coming into being. These things, then, as I have said, were what that godly-minded teacher was thinking. And it seems to me that whereas he quite fittingly identified the saints by the modes of genus and rank, which belong to them through contemplation, he also identified the great John by the mode of place. This is because Saint John, as a preacher of repentance, is an image of the practical life. As a hermit, he is an image of dispassion. And as a Levite and priest, he has an image or model of cognitive contemplation. And inasmuch as he leapt in his mother's womb at the approach of the word, he is a symbol of an unchanging habit of virtue and, and knowledge. St. David, on the other hand, as a Judean and a shepherd, is an image of practical philosophy arrived at through confession. But as the king of Israel, he represents initiation into contemplation. The genus of St. John is the nation and tribe from which he had his existence, while his rank and occupation were preaching and the priesthood. His place, his place was the desert in which he dwelt. The same is true for St. David. His genus is of his nature and tribe, while his occupation, that is, his rank, is that of shepherd and king. And then this phrase. By means of these modes, each of these saints, when seen for what he is, in light of the proper principles of the modes that apply to him, 
unfailingly reveals the mystery that is made known through him. Just to read that last bit again. By means of these modes, each of these saints, when seen for what he is in light of the proper principle of the modes that apply to him, unfailingly reveals the mystery that is made known through him. No. So just walking through this passage on page 85, we begin with the idea of shadow and image, shadow and image near the top of 85. That's our ontological condition. But our ontological condition is blessed, we remember. So we're not speaking about a denigration here. We're just speaking about images. And then he draws in the language of truth and type, or tri type and truth. Manifestation is linked with type, and truth is manifested with being. And it says, his pre the presence of Christ is comprehended. He uses the word comprehended in type and truth. And yet, Christ's horizon is, is beyond our sense of form and movement. Christ is beyond our aesthetic sense. So comprehended is a, is a curious word here. But what we comprehend, we understand to be truth. And Maximus says, Christ is beyond truth. Christ transcends truth. He transcends truth in the same sense that he transcends what is gathered in his gift to us. He is fully present and yet transcends, we are taught. And then on page 87, uh, just the, 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 the last part of that first big par uh, first paragraph, which by divine grace formed within them throughout their whole habit of mind, the quality of simplicity that is natural to the divine. So Christ transforms us by simplifying our movement, clarifying our form. And then just that, that final uh, reflection at the end of the uh, ambiguum. We see that, that, that these saints are models of, of the double mode. And that, and that saints are able, by the strong grace of this double mode, this being both in time and beyond time, one aspect of it, that they reveal the meaning of their time in light of the eternal. Maximus says unfailingly. So this, the saints bestride time and the eternal. They bestride it. And they draw them together for us. Okay. okay. Moving on to Ambiguum 38. Um, let's read the passage from St. Gregory and then just reflect a little bit on, on how Maximus begins to speak. So this is page 89. This is Ambiguum 38, 38 from St. Gregory's same oration on the, on the Nativity. St. Gregory writes, if he flees into Egypt, eagerly flee together with him, for it is good to flee together with the persecuted Christ. Should he linger in Egypt, call him out of Egypt, for there he is rightly worshipped. This idea of calling, calling unto. The divine calls unto us, calls us unto him. And our own calling out becomes synergetic. The, the calling of our heart or the desire of our soul, which corresponds to the divine calling unto us.
our response to the call, the call of, of, of Christ or Christ's call to us. This is a page 91, turn to page 91. <clears throat> so if, if our calling is, as it were, a co-calling, just as our response is, is a co-response, we respond out of our love for our gift, what we've been given. And the response inwardly forms our call. And insofar as our call is synergetic, it partakes of the divine. Uh, maybe 12, 10 or 12 lines down 91. Maximus uses the phrase, the form of Christ, that is our habit of mind. The form of Christ, that is our habit of mind. This form of Christ is a Christo ide, uh, like idos uh, image um, or form. It's linked here with habit of mind or exine, exis, this word which we saw earlier. Hmm. So the form of Christ, form belongs to movements, but Christ belongs beyond movements. The form of Christ, our habit of mind. <laughs> Maximus talks about how when our mind is not attuned, it can become uh, tyrannous, tyrannous to us. This is on page 95. Um, just the end of the, of the, of the uh, ambiguum. And here, here is what happens when, when the call and the response are, are made appropriately and the form of Christ is gathered unto us. Four lines from the top of page 95. Maximus says, Yet with the gradual eradication of the mind of flesh, something contrary to this holy habit of mind which he's talking about, yet with the gradual eradication of the mind of flesh through the hardships of the practical life, he ebbs away like a dissolving course, corpse, leaving not even so much as a trace of his former tyranny, so that those who have attained their freedom through Christ can cry out, can call out, can cry out even before the general general resurrection on account of the voluntary, voluntary resurrection of their will that has already taken place and say, death, where is thy sting? Hades, where is thy victory? In other words, the pleasure of the flesh and its affinitive power to deceive the soul through ignorance by means of which, before the advent of Christ, the all-abominable devil held sway over human nature, and without pity wounded it with the sting of nature, relentlessly driving it to destruction by the sort of, pardon me, by the sort of deception. The form of Christ is opposite to the spirit of deception, which uh, misleads and becomes tyrannous. And with this form of Christ, we begin to partake of that life beyond mortality. And, and as we do on Pascha, we call out to the life of the resurrection, as it were, before, um, before its historical enactments, before its, its uh, uh, typological uh, meaning. Now, Ambiguum 39, just to, just to um, move through this one too, um, with a few comments. Ambiguum 39, page 95. This is from St. Gregory's oration on the Theophany. So this is St. Gregory. So if they were absolutely bound to be impious and to fall away from the glory of God, being led astray to idols and fabrications of art and things fashioned by hands, Men of sense could not imprecate anything worse upon them than, th than that they might worship and honor such things. Now, St. Gregory is talking here uh, about not a double mode, 
but a divided mode, not a double mode, but a divided mode where our being and our making are at odds with each other. And we begin to think that the objects of our hands are the purpose of our hands rather than the synergy between our hand and object. Gregory begins, so if, so if, and the question is, why do we turn from what is ultimate to what is derivative? Why do we turn from what is ultimate to what is derivative? Why do we turn from what is real to what has usurped its place? Or put a little bit differently, how has our sense of hierarchy become so degraded? Why must we see things as divided and therefore segregated and uh, to be uh, idolized rather than as part of an integral or doubled horizon? So that's the that's one question. He refers on on page ninety seven or uh, yeah ninety seven to the Greeks who, who were who were deluded, deluded. And the passage is not important particularly, but but this word delusion, which is just uh, well, it's, it's it's being misled by false light. It's dwelling with 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 false clarity. And without a double mode of being and perceiving, temporal and beyond temporal, for example, we may confuse a thing for its for its antistroke or an idol for reality. Or we might confuse the term as, seeing this as that, for the term is, seeing this is that. And we begin to conflate or confuse temporal and atemporal categories. And this happens when, when we consider by our own light, in terms of our own light, this is the delusion. And our own light in this world, uh, or rather in this life, is mortal. And so it is um, bounded by death. Okay. Let's uh, let, let's move on to Ambiguum Forty, and and perhaps a little bit of of reading. Um, Ambiguum Forty is about light as well. Michael, would you would you be willing to read a little bit? Uh, for us sure if you would please ambiguum 40 from from the top so page 99 right over to page 101 the, the whole thing please and thank you ambiguum 40 from saint gregory's same oration on the the alchemy where there is purification there is also illumination and illumination is the fulfillment of longing among those who desire the greatest or the greatest or something beyond what is great those who comprehend divine mysteries say that where there is purification of the soul by the virtues, there is also illumination by knowledge. Subsequent to pious reflection on beings, this illumination raises up the soul to the understanding of God and unites its desire with the ultimate object of its desire, which is God, who properly speaking exists in and is known in the greatest in the greatest and in beyond what is great. He is known in the greatest since he exists in three hypostases that are one in essence and power and which are unconfused by virtue of the precise and unalterable property of each, by which I mean in generativeness, generation and procession. And he is known in the greatest, that is the unity, identity, and uniqueness of the Godhead according to essence and as beyond what is great, since the divine is not circumscribed by any quantity, magnitude, or spatial extension, nor is it marked off by any limits, for every magnitude is strictly limited whereas the divine alone is limitless. As the great David says, the Lord is great and greatly to be praised and there is no limit to his majesty. Insofar as the divine is not limited by any boundary. For this reason, the divine is infinite and transcends 
absolutely all of the concepts of time or nature that have been devised by those who follow the technical method of logical syllogisms. For these men have proved to be completely useless in the discovery of the truth since they are incapable of believing in the existence of anything that cannot be apprehended by their thoughts. The teacher himself makes clear that this is his meaning since he uses these same expressions in other places. Thus, in his oration on the arrival of those from Egypt while expounding theologically on the uncreated and divine essence, and on the creative nature that received the beginning of its being, he says that the one is called God and subsists in three greatests, namely the cause, creator, and perfecter, by which I mean the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, in his oration on baptism, in speaking of one and the same holy divinity in three holy hypostases, he says, in every respect, it is equal. In every respect, it is the same, just as the beauty and greatness of heaven is one. It is an infinite cohesion of three infinite ones. As you can see, to those who possess more than a merely superficial acquaintance with his divine orations, the teacher interprets himself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay. Let's 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 walk through this slowly. Maximus, uh, well, begins his his comments with it with a qualification that he is paraphrasing. Those who comprehend divine mysteries say. Fair enough. Fair enough. Gregory is phrasing there where there is purification, there is illumination, and illumination is the fulfillment of longing. There's a phrase that that um, David, you'll you'll know this um, better than I. There's a phrase which which rings out in the tradition: purification, illumination, glorification. It's a kind of way of trying to discern three steps in the spiritual life towards some kind of sense of of the whole or or perfection. That came to mind here, but but more than than linking it with a with a sense of progression and therefore purification to be left behind and then illumination to be left behind. Just to focus on on each for a little bit. Pure. Pure is a hard word for us. I think it's like simple, but but in terms of movements, we might say that 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 our our movements are 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 most pure when they are when they are um, when our own is unto Christ's own, when our whole being is a being unto the logos, an integral being unto. Because it it. It won't mean something like lack of error or um, perfect comprehension, something like that. Illumination, so purification, illumination by knowledge, illumination by knowledge, as he says. Well, knowledge, though, knowledge means intimate, loving participation in something. Right, that's what the 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 depth of the of, of the word means in the tradition, uh, the, in the, the the whole Judeo Christian tradition. So after we become dispassionate, purif purif purified or purification, our light illumination becomes compassionate. We know. In, in in loving knowledge are, are, that, that's the light and in this light he says maxima says this illumination and the soul understands god understands god
and become complete. The, the, the body and soul become complete in this light. And illumination is the fulfillment of longing. So fulfillment of longing then. To be complete, the completion of illumination means the unity of, of what is desired and, and what is desiring, the desire and the desired. The fulfillment of our longing. Our longing then might be the fundamental movement of our whole being, a longing for, and then we could say, um, we could, we could, we could. Um, expand that uh, perhaps variously but a longing for completion a longing for the divine a longing for wholeness a longing for perfect love when longing is fulfilled though uh, peace peace reigns when longing is fulfilled and in peace our movement isn't so much longing anymore as it is enjoyment or to use a term we have used often here dancing Dancing is a different kind of movement than longing or seeking or struggling or striving. Maybe, maybe. And then Gregory says, who desire the greatest or the greatest or something beyond what is great. And he, as, as we heard in Michael's reading, he nicely lays out the greatest and the greatest. Something beyond. We... When I first read that, I I I I I moved too quickly through Saint Gregory's words, and Maximus brought me up and and made me pause. And it's it's wonderful to 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 know that Saint Gregory's phrasing is is so beautifully and precisely cadenced that he gives honor to all, all parts of language, all parts of language. But that something beyond is like a signpost. It's saying, here is language as a gesture that includes, a gesture that includes something more than itself. This is what language does as well. The, the, there's, there's much that we can say, and this is one of the ones that we should return to, I think, and, and, and work through. But just to just to comment on the last three lines uh, of this ambiguum before moving on to ambiguum 41. Maximus says, as you can see, to those who possess more than a merely superficial acquaintance with his divine orations, the teacher interprets himself. Interprets himself. There's resonance here, Maximus is saying. There's integrity that this holy fire is complete. We see this or that of it. And so Maximus refers to, to the inner, inner coherence of Gregory's thinking. Inner coherence or integrity. And I think the word resonance, which I, f I forget, Ahmed or Michael or David, maybe one of you or maybe another introduced uh, some weeks ago, is such a lovely word here. When things resonate or they are in tune, then, then the holy fire, the communion, the warmth, the blessedness is shared with ease between. And finally, moving on to uh, Ambiguum 41. This is long and 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 quite involved, so so we'll we'll only be able to touch little bits of it. This is on page 103. Following, it's about eight or ten pages long. Um, Ahmed, could I could I get you to to read a little bit, uh, please? If you wouldn't mind reading from, so the top of 103, and then just turn over to 107. You see the end of the, the main full paragraph? Which he exists? No, objects, the next one, objects standing in his way. Would you mind reading from the beginning until there, please? Thank you. Thank you. 
from St. Gregory's same oration on the Theophany. So this is St. Gregory's, uh, this is St. Gregory. The natures are innovated and God becomes man. And Maximus begins here. Having received the greater part of the divine mysteries handed down to them in succession from those who before them were the followers and ministers of the word, and being directly initiated into the knowledge of beings through these mysteries, the saints say that the existence of all things that have come into being is marked by five divisions. The first of these, they say, is that which divides the uncreated nature from the whole of created nature, which received its being through a process of becoming. For they say that whereas God in his goodness created the splendid orderly arrangement of all beings, it is not immediately self-evident to this orderly arrangement who and what God is. And they call division the ignorance of what it is that distinguishes creation from God. For to that which naturally divides these realities from each other, and which excludes their union in a single essence, since it cannot admit of one and the same definition, they did not give a name. The second is that according to which the, sorry, the second is that according to which the totality of nature, which received its being through creation by God, is divided into the intelligible and the sensible. The third is that according to which sensible nature is divided into heaven and earth. The fourth is that according to which the earth is divided into paradise and the inhabited world. And the fifth is that according to which man, who is above all, like a most capacious workshop containing all things, naturally mediating through himself all the divided extremes, and who by design has been beneficially placed amid beings, above all, is divided into male and female, manifestly possessing by nature the full potential to draw all the extremes into unity through their means by virtue of his characteristic attribute of being related to the divided extremes through his own parts. Through this potential, consistent with the purpose behind the origination of divided beings, man was called to achieve within himself the mode of their completion, and so bring to light the great mystery of the divine plan, realizing in God the union of the extremes which exist among beings by harmoniously advancing in an ascending sequence from the proximate to the remote and from the inferior to the superior. This is why man was introduced last among beings, like a kind of natural bond mediating between the universal extremes through his parts and unifying through himself things that by nature are separated from each other by a great distance so that by making of his own division a beginning of the unity which gathers up all things to God their author and proceeding by order and rank through the mean terms, he might reach the limit of the sublime ascent that comes about through the union of all things in God, in whom there is no division, completely shaking off from nature by means of a supremely dispassionate condition of divine virtue, the property of male and female, which in no way was linked to the original principle of the divine plan concerning human generation, so that he might be shown forth as and become solely a human being according to the divine plan, not divided by the designation of male and female, according to the principle by which he formerly came into being, nor divided into the parts that now appear around him, thanks to the perfect union, as I said, with his own principle, according to which he exists. Then, once he had united paradise and the inhabited world through his own proper holy way of life, man would have fashioned a single earth, not divided by him in the difference of its parts, but rather gathered together. For to none of its parts would he be subjected. After this, having united heaven and earth through a life identical in virtue in every manner with that of the angels, as much as this is humanly possible, 
he would have made the sensible creation absolutely identical and indivisible with itself, not in any way dividing it into places separated by distances. For he would have become nimble by means of the spirit without any corporeal weight holding him to the earth and thus proceed unhindered in his ascent to the heavens. For his intellect would no longer behold such things, but hasten purely to God. And in the wisdom of his gradual ascent to God, just as if he were traveling on an ordinary road, he would naturally overcome any obstacles standing in his way. Thank you. Um, we'll continue with a bit more reading, but let's 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 walk through some of these initial ideas here. And and this is much more in the mode of of uh, wondering, because this ambiguum is uh, is is really immense. So, uh, turn turn back to one to page one zero three, please. But the first thing we can note is that natures natures are plural. Natures are innovated. I'm not sure what that nature, the the, the plural, <clears throat> means, but the natures are innov in, innovated, and God becomes man. Innovated is is uh, I'm not probing that word right now, but but perhaps one might later. Then I wondered why nature instead of being. We often sometimes we we, we confuse the, the two of them if we're speaking casually. But nature, if if we think, hmm, why nature instead of being? Why not our being is innovated or renewed? But nature qualifies being, qualifies being, and may may have to do with, or uh, you know, suggestions. It has to do with existence. That nature has to do with existence rather than being per se. Um, we think about th things being against nature or of its nature, how it is. And so it seems like nature kind of means the appropriately directed gifts of our being. You know, the gifts of our being appropriately directed is understood as nature, maybe. And in that sense, the phrase natures are innovated means something more like what is incarnate is renewed rather than what is abstract is recapitulated or what has been argued is restated. The second word becomes, God becomes man, becomes or becoming. This is such a great word, but but we could think of it just 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 for for to frolic a minute. One can think of becoming in terms of ontological movement, you know, one becomes another. It could also be an aesthetic statement this is becoming right god becomes man god is beautiful in man as man or man is beautiful in as god it also seems to indicate a transposition of our ultimate beyond what we understand to be to be beyond all suddenly becomes something which suggests it, 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 it's, a, it's a very bold and, and strange statement. So becoming. And then Maximus begins to distinguish. Distinguish, he says, uh, not division, but distinguish. He, 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 he makes distinctions. And we think, hmm, he's distinguishing or making distinctions to be careful here. This is page 103, kind of over to 105. He's making distinctions to be careful. And as we saw earlier, you distinguish in order to relate. And so the discernment, which he's really talking about, the quality of discerning, is means to carefully relate, to carefully relate. And then Maximus moves say, uh, to, to the language of according to which man this is the top of 105. So not just distinction or discernment, but one who discerns. And we see this means to be a man, to be a person, means means to carefully integrate, not just carefully relate. That's the job of discernment. 
and he relates man to a workshop, the human being to a workshop, right? And this workshop has 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 uh, associations in Greek, which mean not only to carefully kind of gestate, but also to give back, to give back unto. You're fashioning your own gift in the workshop and giving back unto. Seven or eight lines down that page, then, we have this phrase, the mode of their completion. The mode of their completion. Man was achieved to achieve, sorry, man was called to achieve within himself the mode of their completion. The mode of their completion. So this mode of completion is our personhood. Mode of completion means our personhood. But if it's the mode of our completion, does that does that change what are we incomplete until until that completion is? And so I think that one could say that we are created whole. We are created whole, but we are completed in synergy with the divine. Our creation lacks nothing. There's, there's no deficiency in created being. But its completion is found in synergetic uh, activity or uh, striving. Yeah, our gift lacks nothing, but its health depends on us, depends upon our degree of participation, as Maximus says. And then, so 105 over the page to 107, though, and when, 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 Maximus is talking about how, how the person unifies or brings unity into the various distinctions or bifurcations of, of creation. This is synergy. This is energy flowing together. But it's also synthesis. Synthesis. It's things being placed together, being grounded together, being given the same horizon. Which means it is also, one could kind of say, sin usia, being together, co-being. Um, sin being together, essential co-being. And this, this sin usia or co-being, the mode which arises from synergy and synthesis, this, this forms part of our double mode as well, a double mode, our mode of co-response. Co-response. <clears throat> Moving, moving on a little bit in, in the text. The bottom of, of 107, Maximus uses the, the imagery, he, he takes it from Dionysus, but the imagery of the ever-giving effusion of the divine. Um, and not to touch that, but, but, to, but to comment on it. There are various metaphors by which philosophers and theologians and churches and traditions have understood what's most intimate to the divinity. And um, I, I th those are beyond, beyond, beyond. But, but we could ask, what does it mean to relate movement to the divine? Or what does it mean to relate orientation to the divine? Or discernment to the divine? What does it mean to even assume that one can or to, to, to engage in that activity of forming those metaphors. That's the only insider statement that, that, that I might have. <clears throat> Synergy, synthesis, we partake of this ever-giving effusion. The natures are in, uh, innovated. Turn to page 109, um, and it, just at the very top, actually. Here, Maximus talks about Intimacy, right? Our intimacy <clears throat> with the divine. And so we'll read it and then just say a few things and then read a little bit more. And finally, in addition to all this, had man united created nature with the uncreated through love, oh, the wonder of God's love for mankind, he would have shown them to be one and the same by the state of grace, the whole man wholly pervading the whole God and becoming everything that God is, without, however, identity in essence, and receiving the whole of God instead of himself 
and obtaining as a kind of prize for his ascent to God, the absolutely unique God, who is the goal of the motion of things that are moved, and the firm and unmoved stability of things that are carried along to him, and the limit, itself limitless and infinite, of every definition, order, and law, whether of mind, intellect, or nature. The movement or the being of God may not be discerned, but our own drawing near has some has some shape to it. Maximus speaks here about about the unity which he he can perceive in grace, and the wonder of God's love. Um, he he sees ecstatically what synergy is or or can do or or will be maybe. He says that that the person man becomes everything or becoming everything. We can think back to that word becoming, but becomes everything, but without identification, without identity in essence. Identity, we've often said identity is is stillborn. it's it's a it's it's a deathly, and it is in 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 mortal terms, because identification is beyond movement. But if we move beyond the aesthetic realm and temporal realm, then identification may regain its 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 uh, its, its value. But it's not appropriate for us. Maximus also talks here about a paradox beyond nature. Just further down the page, paradox beyond nature. The natures were innovated, which is a paradox beyond nature. So nature observes our categories. Right. Otherwise, there wouldn't be paradoxes beyond nature. Being does not observe our categories. Not simply. Nature does, apparently. All right. Now let's, <clears throat> let's read a little bit more. So, turn to page one eleven, please, and we'll just read one eleven over to uh, over to one fifteen to end off, and and then we'll we'll open up to to um, to to dialogue to conversation. There are three things here. There's the image or the idea of convergence, flowing together synergy there are there's the idea of of the double mode as if and according to and also there's the idea of of today of the eternal present uh eternal joy okay so this is page 111 just seven lines up from the bottom the the beginning of that paragraph then having sanctified our inhabited world by the dignity by the dignity of his conduct as man, he proceeded unhindered to paradise after his death, just as he truly promised to the thief, saying, Today you will be with me in paradise. Consequently, since there was for him no difference between paradise and our inhabited world, there was no difference between paradise and our inhabited world, he appeared on it and spent time together with his disciples after his resurrection from the dead demonstrating that the earth is one and not divided against itself, for it preserves the principle of its existence free of any difference caused by division. Then, by his ascension into heaven, it is obvious that he, he united heaven and earth, for he entered heaven with his earthly body, which is of the same nature and consubstantial with ours, and showed that, according to its more universal principle, all sensible nature is one, and he thus obscured in himself the property of division that had cut it in two. Then, in addition to this, having passed with his soul and body, that is, with the whole of our nature, through all the divine and intelligible orders of heaven, he united sensible things with intelligible things, 
displaying in himself in himself the fact that the convergence of the entire creation towards unity was absolutely individual sorry <clears throat> displaying in himself the fact that the convergence of the entire creation toward unity was absolutely indivisible and beyond all fracture in accordance with its most primal and most universal principle and finally after all of these things he considered according to according to the idea of his humanity comes to god himself appearing as a man as it is written before the face of god the father on our behalf he who has word can never in any way be separated from the father fulfilling as man in deed and truth and with perfect obedience all that he himself as god had preordained should take place having completed the whole plan of god the father for us who through our misuse had rendered ineffective the power that was given to us from the beginning by nature for this purpose thus he united first of all ourselves in himself through removal of the difference between male and female and instead of men and women in whom this mode of division is especially evident he showed us properly and truly to be simply human beings thoroughly formed according to him bearing his exact image bearing his image intact rather and completely unadulterated touched in no way by any marks of corruption and with us and for us he he encompassed the extremes of the whole creation through the means as his own parts and he joined them round himself each with the other tightly and indissolubly paradise and the inhabited world heaven and earth the sensible and the intelligible since like us he possesses a body sense perception soul intellect to which as his own parts he associated individually the extreme that was thoroughly akin to each one of them i e his parts according to the mode described above and he recapitulated in himself in a manner appropriate to god all things showing that the whole creation is one as if there's that double mode as if it were another human being completed with the mutual coming together of all its members inclining toward itself in the wholeness of its of its existence according to one unique simple undefiled and unchangeable idea that it comes from nothing accordingly all creation admits of one and the same absolutely undifferentiated principle that its existence is preceded by non-existence hmm. Okay. just to briefly and then to open this up he refers to the idea of, of convergence so this intimacy of of ours with with the divine is felt as concurrence as confluence we talked about about uh, uh, obedience as confluence and we've talked about the conscience as confluence before now here is intimacy as confluence we converge we draw near we are drawn together and we become as one when things converge they're as one also throughout but especially on pages on page 115 at the end he uses the phrases as if and according to as if and according to as if we've we, we've we've noted several times is is the the fundamental aesthetic move or, or fundamental to the double mode seeing this as that seeing this as if that seeing this in terms of that and according to the phrase according to which translates kata like cataphasis according to is positive it draws from what is real what is palpable what is present so the as if and the according to the aesthetic and the cataphatic dance together unto a higher unity which points beyond things which have existence hmm. and then this is page 111 but 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 throughout 
Maximus uses the word today and then and then again, again. When he introduces a new interpretation, often he says again. And again signals seems to signal hope in time. He's saying again, again. This is again. It also is a term that is used throughout um throughout uh, the Orthodox liturgy with the with the great litanies, again and again. We draw forth the world and offer it unto God. But at the bottom of page 111, we have the phrase of Christ to the thief, today, you will be with me in paradise. Today. And this word today, we might begin here. Today. Today is confidence in eternity. Immediately thereafter, Maximus says, there's no difference between paradise and our inhabitant world for one who is Christ. It's confidence in eternity. And today is also we're nearly in, we're, we're in the paschal season now but today is the great cry of the resurrection it's a paschal shout which is like a leap like the leaping that john and david did as we read at the beginning today is the cry of life over death it's the cry of presence here and now with us which is the gift the gift Ah. So where might we, where might we, where might we begin here? I have kind of a query, and it goes back to um, where you began, Andrew. Yeah, let's circle back. Yeah. And where um, where he begins with with both the image of John the Baptist in his mother's womb. When uh, do you know this narrative? Ahmed? There's this story in the gospel about um, Mary when uh, she receives the, the annunciation from the angel, Gabriel, the same angel that visited Mohammed. And, um, and she's pregnant that she goes to see her relative, Elizabeth. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful image in iconography. You see their pregnant bellies and you often see them touching each other. It's beautiful. And the gospel narrative speaks about Elizabeth is also pregnant and she's been pregnant for a longer time. And uh, she's the mother of John the Baptist. And when they meet, it says that John the Baptist, the womb child, leaps in, his, in the womb at um, the encounter. And then David, King David, dancing before the ark, you know, David wanted to build the temple, but he didn't get the chance. But he had the ark. So he dances before the ark, the ark of presence. I mean, these are all images like temple of presence. And of course, the womb of Mary is, um, is the temple as well. So in any case, you spoke... Andrew, about the joy at meeting Christ, uh, the joy of the response that this is ecstatic. It takes you out of your soul. So I want to turn it around. 
is it is it also the case or do I go too far? Is it also the case that when one experiences ecstasy, that that is, that whatever has arisen there, <clears throat> that is an anointed moment that is the place of the presence so all i'm all i'm getting at is is pretty simple it the way you phrased it could be taken as a kind of theophany of Jesus Christ, a theophany <coughs> uh, coming into the presence. But is it not also saying that whenever that happens, in whatever circumstance that that happens and for whomever it happens, that that is, I mean, if it is genuine ecstasy as opposed to delusion, you are taken out of yourself in joy, that that is a theophany, that that is an encounter with Christ. It's, 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 I mean, you speak very carefully as one must. Um, this is why we, we hold both presence and for the sake of together. But I think, I think that, I think fundamentally you, you, you speak something true here that, that to live a life of joyful giving out of oneself unto and partaking of the joy of others who are in their presence giving out and unto that that strikes me as as to see the logos as everywhere present and filling yeah. all things which is the same thing as saying to see creation yeah so i think that's a i think that's a that's a beautiful way of 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 putting this and part, part of the part of the 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 beautiful thing about joy is that it is radically oh, you you signal this in, in in even how you frame your comments it's radically open to whomever it doesn't depend on any kind of aptitude apart from the response of one's being to the response of another's being in the moment in loving giving we see it so vividly in babies mm. and i you know i've um I think I've only really met two or three people in my life who had what medicine diagnoses as Down syndrome. And it has always just amazed me at the kind of presence of joy that these people have in the world. I mean, it's a remark, and I mean, I'm not the only one to remark on this, that's for sure. But it's always just amazing the kind of, I mean, I think that's it. They're kind of special saints in the world, <laughs> given the way they they respond to, to the world. So this is also, this also speaks to his use of the term that you talked about the double mode i mean is, there's a sense in which any time that arises in a person's life it arises as a double mode i mean it arises as as uh, that which um is closer to them particularly than their own breath that is it is deeply deeply personal and 
existential. And at the same time, it doesn't have anything to do with them. Or maybe that's not quite the way, right way to put it, but they're not the originators of it. <laughs> you know, it's a gift. Isn't it, it's interesting that those, you know, the, the example you gave, David, of the individuals with Down syndrome, people often label them as simple. Yeah, right. That's simple. beautiful. Aren't they lucky? Yeah. And this is, yeah. this is somehow pejorative yeah. in, in a deeper sense. Being yeah. as simple gives them access to something that yeah. is, is profound. And yeah. yeah. One thing that um, one thing that uh, Ahmed and I know know this writer who who one of his uh, examples of this idea of the simplicity of this of this gift of mind is to enjoy a simple object for its innate quality like a banana because it's yellow just because it's yellow right for itself and not to try to draw conclusions from it or think about how it might be used or how might I grasp it but just to just to enjoy it for itself. <laughs> And it strikes me that Maximus is one of the things he's doing in this this suite of ambigua. That's beginning with the with with the the longer bits on David and John. I hesitate. I was going to read out those, and we might because because they're interesting. But it's a number of historical images and and ideas and and so on, kind of walking through the the features of the lives of these two great men. But in each case, he's saying. This is important, but don't mistake its importance. Don't abstract from its reality for your own, you know, for your own sake. Or be wary about how you understand, which is why he distinguishes, I think, between symbol and type and, and image and so on. Today is the same kind of move, but not in terms of meaning, but in terms of time. The Desert Fathers say, I think I, maybe I didn't say this earlier. I meant it's in my notes, but the Desert Fathers say that the great, the great tempting word is tomorrow. It's never not or don't or impossible. It's just tomorrow. Do that tomorrow. Sorry, do it tomorrow. Today, which is um, presence and response, is the. <laughs> Count, uh, just different than that. It, it's a different orientation. And then, enough, if 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 I can just raise one other one other matter for um, clarification, this notion that Christ transcends truth. I know there's been these debates sometimes about if you had to choose between God and truth, what do you choose? Well, you choose truth is a common trope. <clears throat> but in this reflection on, on, I guess it was, you know, um, a little later on, where he talks about uh, shadow and image and type. You talked about type and truth. Yeah, page 85. Yeah, 85. That Christ uh, transcends the truth. So is there, I mean, what I take that to mean, I take it as a kind of a uh, caution to us, to um, to not turn truth into something, to not assume that truth is 
is something or is complete or finished that it is um, and of course the same with so when we're talking about Christ transcending truth we're also saying that if you think you if you think this is Christ, if you think this is it, if you can get your hands around the neck, then you don't have it. Because this is so it's the emphasis on it's the emphasis on the transforming character of the encounter it's never something mm. it's the dynamic relationship that unfolds So when, when Jesus Christ says the truth shall make you free, another way of putting that is that when you experience presence, you're no longer bound by whatever you thought was significant or the point or whatever kind of instrumental intention was there. Again, it's this emphasis on I mean, it's this emphasis on the the dynamic way the eternal unfolds and transforms the temporal. You talked about saints. I mean, you had that nice phrase about saints bestride time and the eternal. They don't bestride time and heaven. It's not about place. It's about that which is... Uh, it's about that transformative meaning that is unfolding. It's unfolding for you and you can't get your hands around it. I mean, afterwards, you might be able to say something about it, but your words aren't going to be quite adequate. But you, you can gesture towards it. So again, it's this emphasis on, on synergy. <clears throat> that this is all about, it's all a kind of call to a kind of disposition of openness to relationship. And then finally, I mean, just to finish this up, this reference to uh, later on in, in uh, 40, to purification is also illumination. And you talked a little bit about purification, illumination, glorification. Um, and I, I liked what you did there. In Maximus, this way, I mean, I've never really thought of it quite this way before. I've often struggled a little bit with this, but I found this really, really lovely. The way in which he talks in Ambiguum 40, 
about cause, creator, perfecter. The cause is the father. I mean, this is one of these Trinitarian things that that are, are, are so fruitful in, in, in the Christian imagination. Because so often people think that the creator is the father, but of course there's all kinds of little problems that arise from that because we talk about Christ being present at, before creation. <clears throat> so cause as father, creator as son, well, incarnation, I mean, all creation is a form of incarnation. All creativity is incarnation. It's got to be some kind of meaning coming together. And then the perfecter as the Holy Spirit. So the cause out of nothingness, out of nothing. this niggly problem deep in the human mind and heart that kind of apprehension that we are moving towards death. And for those that work at it, a recognition that we come from nothing. That, I mean, Heidegger is pretty preoccupied with this as well as a whole bunch of others. So this notion that the cause is the delight of the creator, or the, the father, the delight of the father, that the creator, this other way of speaking about God is incarnation. Jesus Christ is identified with the creator because only when things are incarnate, <clears throat> when they take on flesh, when they uh, are moving in the world, in some sense, can we know they exist? But then that's marvelous, but there's something more, which is this notion of the call. I mean, Maximus talks about this in so many places. The call to being is beautiful, but to well-being is a whole nother move, a whole nother matter. And that's seen in that sort of tripartite consideration as, as the movement of the Holy Spirit. I was also taken with the phrase, um, the simple, unchangeable idea that things come from nothing. That seems to David mention that it's related to being and then well being. And maybe this is a way to stave off the irresistible idea of trying to characterize being and then on an evaluative footing relate its value to some kind of use or other as opposed which is isn't a isn't a um, sustainable idea because eventually if you're trying to find a useful what what use is the standard that you're appealing to and it just leads you into um, well into a kind of um, negative sense of nothing, if that makes sense. But there's a sense of things coming from nothing because there's 
it represents a calling for something that is intrinsically valuable or beautiful or you call for it for its own sake and it, it's not coming from something that can be um, represented beyond its self which might be one way of thinking of presence and without such a notion of course um, i think the very idea of value um, disintegrates mm -hmm. an ironic paradox that only if something comes from nothing or nothing that we can account for yeah. could it possibly have um, a kind of value i i've been just for um my own re reasons reading um wittgenstein's tractatus uh, again and it's a book that Wittgenstein didn't um, didn't affirm without unproblematically his you know whole life, but there are these um, enigmatic statements that come out of it. And one concern that I I don't think he renounces is that when we account for things completely. And I was thinking this when David was talking about uh, God as a cause, as opposed to causality in the normal sense in which we think of it as the, um, the basis of scientific explanation. We have this, at least this is Wittgenstein's view, this, this view that the general principles of physics, um, science, <coughs> explain things and of course they 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 do in a useful sense but ultimately they they don't and of course the notion we have of causation is a ultimately a kind of empty notion it's a pragmatic um, notion that's highly useful but and that leads into i i'm not sure whether what what i think of this is just one of these suggestive um, thoughts that wittgenstein um, introduced in the tractatus and that when we've um, exhausted scientific explanations, we've not really touched anything. Everything is um, that matters is sort of left alone. That Wittgenstein adopts a rather austerely mystical view of, of um, everything beyond science at that stage. And maybe, maybe he, uh, in some sense, maintains that view. That aside, there is something kind of haunting about uh, things coming out of nothing. And just um, just a final thought, I realize I'm kind of, my thoughts are a little scattered. I'm going uh, all, all over the place rather randomly. But of course, when you talk about um, everything coming from nothing, it, it, it might raise that question of why is there anything rather than than nothing, and if everything comes from nothing in some sense, then can't really make much sense of it. In a sense, I, I hesitate to say this because um, it's a, a haunting thing. Why does everything come from, why is there anything at all rather than nothing? But in a sense, it provides um, an answer to that question. It may be being itself, everything that exists is simply intrinsically good. I hope that doesn't sound like a kind of kitschy affirmation of um, that sentiment in Genesis, um, but I, and it's not, one can't offer proof of such an assertion, but it's an assertion that we, we might, what one might dwell with i'll leave it there michael your uh your comment about everything that existing everything that exists is good uh there's something that maximus said earlier on in the one of the earlier ambigua that we we've, we've read about he was talking about providence and he he said something i'm obviously paraphrasing that when when a creature is in being so to be in being is to be cared for already or to be in care so if you do exist in some uh, this is my reading uh, 
when he when he speaks of providence that to exist is already to be in the care of god so that's one thing the other thing is the the dichotomy of something and nothing i find it like you maybe not like you but i find it to be a dead end in in speaking about life uh i actually in reading maximus the dichotomy between created and uncreated to me is more fruitful and a way of getting around it seems to me the 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 the, the framing of things through something and nothing already privileges the 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 uh what is what is what is nihilo like it it comes from that position to begin with it's almost yeah. like a statement of unfaith you begin with a statement of unfaith and you look at the world and life and there can that can bear no fruit now the question becomes where does the trust in existence where is that rooted so there are uh, you know the I'm sure for you as well. There are people who tend to just naturally be like David's example of the of of the of the individuals with Down syndrome who tend to have a innate openness, a, a trust in 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 the world. Now, where that comes from, for me, that's that's the mystery, and that's the thing that seems to me to be the, the what is fruitful. To, to find out what's there the distinction between something and nothing yeah it's it's a it's a dead end other than other than a than a game than a rhetorical game or a philosophical game you know yeah. the framework is not fruitful this is another thing about reading maximus it's fruitful like the concepts he puts forward tend to at least myself tend to guide one or me towards that place of trust and that place of belief and faith and so i tend to trust him more and more and it just grows and it feeds whereas the something nothing is always you know poking at the balloon it's finding the balloon to poke at so can it explode it and then say well why isn't the balloon intact always and and why is it exploding well so anyway, so I'll, uh, yeah, I'll stop ranting. This is uh... can I um, take up on just one thing you said just at the very beginning. I you might have um, you might have quoted me accurately because um, when we say things on the top of our head, of course, uh, we sometimes misspeak ourselves. But I would distinguish between um, saying that um, everything is is good. I, I should have probably said that being being is good. Hmm. The, the very nature of being is good and it if it comes from nothing there's it comes from no agenda let's say it could be good by virtue of being intrinsically good so the nothing itself probably would have to be qualified i share your hesitation it reminds me of um, um well it's one it's one way of looking at um hegel's um, discussion of um, being and nothing he properly situates these at the this um, at the beginning of philosophy, and he thinks that um, these are this is a, these are conceptual contrasts that have to be overcome. And I think that's built into, and this is what what I'm getting at: distinguishing um, particular beings from let's call it the logos or God. And I'm actually quoting right now um, the end of the um, the last volume when when maximus is talking about um, god is um, he's introducing this paradox god is um doesn't exist god god is um everything is in everything but he doesn't um he isn't anything and then he goes on to say that god is in everything and he is also beyond he uses the word opera He's also beyond everything. And I think what he's, um, at least this is one way of reading Maximus is obviously a difficult um, ex exegesis with regard to Maximus is always difficult, but he seems 
seems to be um, suggesting that that whenever we try to put our fingers on a particular aspect of being or or if we're making a statement a particular you know we're asserting a particular proposition it's always as David was saying you know, something that doesn't quite capture things and so in that sense um, we can talk about you know God transcending truth even though he's all truth in a sense but he's also simultaneously beyond um, beyond all beings so there could, so I think this is actually affirming sort of what you were saying there has to be a notion of fruitfulness built in and so if we if we just um, utter that nothing is itself becoming something that we think we can we're talking about something then it it becomes problematic so so I don't know if that qualifies at all the the, the sense that Maximus um, had in mind when he talks about you know everything coming from nothing I I don't think he's raising the nothing up as some kind of mysterious or opaque thing as such but rather saying suggesting that it suggests something beyond just nothingness um, but I think we would, you know, we'd have an apophatic, I mean, we could be, uh, if we're in a kind of apophatic mode, this is probably at the, we're at the end of our tether where we try to characterize um, that of which everything comes. And so nothing is a, a kind of worrisome placeholder, but you know, so I kind of concur with more or less where I took you to be heading there. Maybe perhaps by way of responding, Michael, I just want to say maybe a query for you. Do you think we can understand that nothing without what Maximus calls the, or not understand that nothing, sorry, but to uh, get past the, 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 the problem of what that nothing portends without what he calls the purification of the virtues? And this, so which is also an ambiguous 41, when he talks about the purification of the virtues and how that purification of the virtues doesn't lead to the illumination by knowledge, but uh, where there is purification of the soul by virtues, there's also illumination by knowledge. When I read that, what I, what I, and I, and I, at first I wanted to ask a general question, a doctrinal question, which is to the Christian ear, because Maximus has used the word virtues throughout and to the Christian ear that might mean something solid and obvious clear so I want to start first before I uh, go into this what would the virtues here refer to M more precisely is it a is it a, 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 sp a specific set of virtues or specific virtues or <laughs> something else I think Dave, David or Andrew would be. Um, yeah, it's a question to refer to here. In general. Go ahead, David. You know, go ahead. Well, the virtues are dispositions. And um, I mean, normally within Christian thought, we we say that the the virtue of faith, of hope, of love are gifts from God. We call them theological virtues. They're, they're not something we can acquire. They're given, they're gratuitous. They're in the very being of our, our they're in our very being. Typically there are virtues which are understood to, to flow from this, which one can, can work at cultivating and of course, the act of purification is part of that cultivation. Um, so virtues aren't, they aren't some thing, but they are dispositions. So faith as a virtue is a disposition of the mind to be attentive, to be open to 
what what is meaningfully unfolding. And hope is a disposition of a disposition towards um, towards the future. Um, so David, just to quick... be a bit of would be like cynicism and 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 love is a disposition of action. And so the disposition is our dispositions can become clouded and we can we can uh, they can become corrupted. But the Christian tradition is that they're there. They're they're the they're the dispositions of our deepest part of our being. They're the way we are. And sin is clouding it over. So purification is the process of clearing that aside a little bit. So you, I think you, you, if I heard you correctly, you mentioned that virtues can be cultivated, correct? So there can be a cultivation of the, because in one sense, they're given, they're a gift. But right. So, I mean, so these three virtues that I mentioned, which are understood to be to be fundamental to the human nature and, and gifts of our very being, gifts of God in and manifest in our very being. But the understanding is, and I mean, this draws on Greek philosophy as well, that there are, you know, the virtues of courage and uh, temperance and justice and what have you. And those are linked to, in most Christian thought, those are linked a bit to these three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. And they are understood to be cardinal virtues. I mean, that's a common word for them. They're virtues that, and I think cardinal in this sense, if I recall correctly, means hinge. They can be cultivated. That part can be cultivated. You can grow in justice. You can you can you can cultivate courage and and uh but but what what they're built on what they're tied to is 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 the virtues of faith hope and charity which are understood to be natural gifts in the being of the person where are we going to go well in ambiguum 40 there's that wonderful movement from the purific where there's purification of the soul by the virtues. There's also illumination by knowledge. And perhaps this is at least this is my way of beginning to understand something you said earlier and something about what Mike has been, Michael has been talking about, which is uh, the dichotomy between truth and God or the experience of truth versus the experience of God and God as something which is, someone something which is un the experience of god being something unbounded and constantly renewed it's something it's an experience that's being constantly renewed in relation with others in presence and truth being a more closed system uh a, a more bounded system and this is in so when we talk about something versus nothing and we we kind of get uh, we can get too involved in the in the to use a word from last week, the prepositional or rhetorical aspect of the language it's speaking about these things. And that sometimes forecloses the openness to renewal, which is which is, in my opinion, at least, it's not something that's intellectual or or right accessible to going back to the simple mm -hmm. it's not accessible through through intellect or or rhetorical thinking or or even you know analytical thinking it's something far deeper but then to get access to that constant renewal or the ability to to experience something in that way i was in reading that line from ambiguum 40 i i, I my thinking is that you get the purification which gives allows the illumination by knowledge requires or or is dependent on something which anybody can has the ability to cultivate or grow or or begin to resonate with to use that word 
And that's where illumination, that's where it's rooted, as opposed to trying to understand through philosophy or rhetoric or intellect that is something more than mind, more than language. And that the knowledge here in the illumination by knowledge is something deeper than truth. Yeah. Especially, I, I don't I hope this is a sound, sound trite, but especially if you're burdened with the, the view of language that um, Wittgenstein, for example, seem, seemed to be burdened with when he was writing the, the Tractatus and and he talks about language as the totality of propositions. And, and he has in mind uh, scientific uh, propositions, scientific truths. In other words, that's all the proposition is the truth. There's an expression of representing it. And I think that's, uh, that's a um, highly seductive and it seems almost obvious notion of language, but it's. Um, mistaken notion language um, it depends on our um, there's a we can talk about a, as persons <laughs> language being at one in a sense with a language because earlier we were talking about persons concept of a person being a concept of humans in relationship and this is a fairly fundamental um, relationship to the, the true. It's that language is a, um, there's a language um, reality relationship. And so to say that language is totality of propositions isn't really even touching that relationship. And of course, when we're talking about a relationship, we're talking about actual persons. And of course, to, just to make a a leap that present company might might sort of accept just as a sheer assertion, which I might not make in another company. The um, person of the logos is um, arguably an essential part of that relationship because we can't understand reality apart from the logos. And this is to circle back to the notion of um, nothing, which I, I was using, you know, sort of thinking of as I didn't really illuminate very, very well when I was quoting Maximus, but when he says that God is not um, anything, well, that's one way of thinking of nothing. It's not any thing, but it's not nothing either. Yeah. I mean, I'm 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 playing with words, I'm not, not, <laughs> not contradicting myself. I hope it's obviously I'm not anything and nothing in some other sense. Uh, using the same word with different meanings, obviously. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out. Michael, so often, I, I, oh, sorry, and on, so, so so often when I hear, sometimes I'll re-listen to these. Uh, these seminars and so often I'll hear myself and I'll hear myself speak and I'll be like okay what I said there it fit it, it made sense and it might have articulated something perhaps there was some insight there but almost invariably there's a, there's not shame but there's a sense in which what I really wanted to do in that moment is to sing with everybody I just want to sing with everybody that's what I wanted to do I didn't actually want to explain anything I didn't want to speak i actually just wanted to to th there's a there's a joy that comes being here being with maximus and i just want to like affirm it and i want to say and a lot of the times when i'm trying to explain something to clarify i actually feel like i'm going astray that what i really need to do is is leap leap you need to leap moment. yes That's where we began and that yeah you know you're right my friend that yeah. leaping, that ecstatic <laughs> response. And Maximus gives so often when I'm when I'm reading him, I get the, that feeling of 
sudden sudden air in my chest and inflate and like just it, it inflates it and it's that place of trust and like yes and you just want to sing and so I, I don't know how relevant that is to to what we're talking about today but it's just apropos language and apropos the leaping with joy but Andrew, sorry, go ahead. Let me know. That's a very apropos. Let, let me try to because you, you three have said so many beautiful things lately. But Andrew, but that, can, I, um, can I jump in with a snappy comment just to just just take two seconds? It, it seems to me that we're we're all kind of in a womb, and um, kicking is a perhaps a sign of recognition. Just to <laughs> make a slight reference to one of the passages. Anyways, go ahead, Andrew. Um. One kicks as well, one kicks. But singing and dancing, Ahmed, is what one does in the clearing, which is what Aletheia means. To circle, I want to circle back through several of the comments made to see if I can't offer something that we can then think about. That truth, how we, I mean, uh, Michael, you, you put it, it, it's nice you were reading Wittgenstein lately because he he is as, you know, crystalline as anyone on, on the 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 extent of, of this kind of um, philosophical certainty of language and so on. Truth as as propositional statement does take you somewhere, but not that far, as you say, Ahmed, and as you say, Michael. Truth is, is a state of things only insofar as a state is in movement, because truth is one of our words, so it's always in movement. It's Aletheia can can I mean one can see in that movement both a bringing to light and a uh, out of darkness let's say to put it negatively or a drawing into presence but both times it's movement on that it's movement and so this the beginning of that of Abingu and forty which you you beautifully just pondered and and dwelt with and feel that truth there's. It, it's it's a movement that we're talking about, a bringing into light or a drawing into presence. And I think it's insofar as, as truth is a movement for us, or even proposition in a lesser form, that to refer to something David, David, you beautifully said earlier, Christ is beyond truth. Beyond truth. Uh, but but Christ being beyond truth doesn't mean that our sense of truth has nothing to do with Christ, because we know from apophasis, from the apophatic thinking, apophatic movement, that you begin with something and then you move with, through, and beyond. And we also know Maximus has taught us that when you name something, you can uh, you can name something atemporally, which needs to be understood temporally, i.e. We can name the saints as God, although that is an a, a, an atemporal term for part of their life, which was experienced temporally. The double mode of thinking, right? So Christ is beyond truth. Of course, he's beyond truth, but that shouldn't perplex us, because Christ is beyond humanity, and yet Christ is hum man, right? So fair enough. But this idea of then of 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 truth and its relation to what is beyond or to or to Christ, David. To come back to, I think that one of the first remarks you made, which I think was really really beautiful and profound, about being in presence, and that presence is transformative. We 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 our our joy seeks presence with another and that presence itself is transformative uh, we 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 um we talk about the mode of existence that christ teaches us the tropos and tropos in english is sometimes characterized as turn or as transformation of something turning it into this transforming into this i i think if i understand you david i i think what i hear in what you're saying that we often Christ is beyond truth. So Christ is beyond our conceptions of truth, as you said, beautifully said. He's beyond how we figure what ought to be true to be. He's beyond that. And Christ is in presence. So when we seek presence with another, we need to somehow move beyond what we think is true or ought to be true. But as we move that beyond what we think 
is true or ought to be true and come into presence, that present transforms our sense of for the sake of. So the reason we sought the presence is almost kind of left behind, as it were. And we realize that we sought something for a reason, but in fact, there's a, there's a higher reason. And so, and so we seek presence, we seek that joy, the ecstatic uplifting going unto, uh, out unto another in joy for presence. True. But in that presence with another, we our, our sense of, of telos or, or, or end or for the sake of is transfigured. Christ is presence. And one of the terms we use for Christ is pantocrator, the all ruler. David wonderfully explicates this. Christ is our measure, in other words. Another way of putting this is that any measure which we think we bring to presence, which we then apply to presence, is surpassed by what we, by that measure, that guide we learn within presence itself. And to me, this is something like, to play on another another uh, uh, image you, you brought up, David, being well being, an eternal well being. If something is 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 not 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 in full being, is existing but but away from being. You need to have being before you can recognize well being. It's only in presence that we recognize <laughs> the for the sake of presence. There might be something there, maybe not. Then, Michael, your idea or your 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 term, which then on the challenge, well, question, and you qualified, and but the idea of existence as being good. Well, it's not uncommon in 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 our tradition to say that all existence is essentially good, and I love how you played with that, Michael. That it is, and therefore, it is not nothing because it is good that there is something, and here it is. And Ahmed, you talked about a trust in existence. A trust in existence. That was a phrase you used. That's verbatim. I hope you recall the context. But the basic feeling, the basic sense, the basic orientation that all existence is essentially good and that you can trust. <laughs> you can trust life. There's meaning there. That's more or less what our tradition understands as faith, or at least as I understand it from what David has taught me. That's more or less it. that fundamental sense of trust and that fundamental sense of openness to the meaning that is right there, incarnate in front of you. You know, Andrew, I wish Lorraine was still with us. Because she is with us. She is with us. Because I think they're at the root of the contemporary phenomenon of mental well-being or mental unwellness. I think at the root of it is a lack of trust in in that lack of trust, lack of faith. To, to... Well, and here's let, let me just pause that thought because there's one more thought, and and then and then go on. That trust in existence, or that all existence is good. Now, this is back to David's meditation on on cause, creator, and perfecter, which is, I mean, it's really that's Dionysius. It's beautiful, and then Michael's further, uh, and and yours too, I think, on that on on the idea of cause, the Father as cause in Christian ontology. This is John Zizulis' point, so I'm I'm paraphrasing probably poorly him. But to introduce the figure of, of the Father as the cause of all being, of all and of, of all, means that the, the, the cause of all, the source of all, is personal, it's free, and it's loving. It's in the form of personhood, it's a free creation, and it's a loving creation. And that then that's what we trust. We don't trust something rather than nothing or to circle around. I like how, I mean, I hear both. I think I hear both what, what, what you and Michael were saying about this because I love the question itself, but also like you, I think, all right, but these socks are too long. We can't walk in them well, right? But it's the trust in that too, not just in life as meaningful, but as co-responding. I'm sorry, my friend, I, I shouldn't have broken it. Go on, please. 
you, you know that's that was beautiful and and yeah regarding mental well-being which is a phrase which is a, a, in vogue and a way and, and a big trope a big huge contemporary cultural trope it seems to me that this is a very modern disease even the you even even the language mental well-being or mental mentally unwell the question i think at bottom a question is you and i love the way you articulated of of trust um to believe in something rather than to believe in nothing where does that come from and this is back to the to the simplicity of the of the simple child or the quote unquote simple person where does that come from maybe that's the gift and but maybe a gift that we reject at some point a gift that we Why do some stray and others not in terms of that trust? Where does that go awry? When do we stop becoming children? When do, when do we stop becoming simple? You know, you know that what, what you just su suggested, Ahmed, um, might be another gloss on simplicity in relation to the the absence of fixed horizons when children um, seem they're obviously bounded in some sense but they they often have a, a sense of um, openness to horizons such that horizons might as well not exist that's why play and make believe are very um, you know it just sort of comes natural to children they can think in this way and we have to kind of construct ourselves to do that because we're so habitually inclined to want to um, pristinely, um, at the risk of undermining things that I've been saying before, propositionally define every um, every boundary. But simplicity, you know, suggests a kind of unity, and that probably presupposes a notion of a horizonality I'm, I'm just trying to find a way to think of the greek word that we've been using um indeterminacy but unfortunately when we use the word indeterminacy today there's a specter of you know deconstruction and um, disintegration and that's unfortunate that's a kind of a, a cynical appropriation of, of um, a more apophatic really affirmative way of thinking of being I'm silent, but I'm singing, Michael. Okay. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I really missed no, out there. I, I just, I, I, I agree with you all, and I love the image of the, you know, the, the make the the make believe world of the child and and that capacity, which just comes to them naturally. I mean, this reminds me of David's David's anecdote about his granddaughter, uh, playing tag and and being very flexible and open with the with the boundaries of the game with the rules of the game and not fearing you know as we yeah and you said like at some point we want to we want to fix the world around us not fix it repair but fix it as in prepositional like you know what is this and then we have a system where that comes from I, you know that's again that's uh but it's interesting because if we go, going back to Maximus, when he talks about the different modes and he walks the reader through the different modes and then takes those 10 modes and then, you know, reduces them to three modes and then reduces them to two. And, but ultimately it, 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 uh, it's the monad, that ultimate category that's beyond what he, I think that this is the phrase of, 
beyond numeration or which is you know so really something deeply qualitative you can't quantify it but then all our categories emanate from that but it's important to recognize that they are the reality is not the numeration the numeration is a is a is an as if to to it's it's a it's a it's it's difficult to talk about these things because it's so they're so deeply they're so deep and profound and i'm worried that sometimes i misstep but it's it's the monad it's that unquantifiable thing you know that is the that's at the heart of knowledge Uh, Michael, your your comments about about the the horizonless uh, existence of, of of one who is simple, naturally or or inevitably. This seems strangely familiar, but not in happy ways, and in ways that I that I don't like to 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 think about. But. It's not that knowledge is is problematic. It's not that 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 knowing more or becoming more complex is problematic. That that is a trope in in some traditions. <clears throat> it, it, it's always in this odd for the sake of that 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 we stumble. It's 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 for the sake of what. And I think what Maximus teaches that is that. When we think of things in terms of grasp, our grasp, that somehow, even beyond us, is for our own sake. And so God is sheer and slips away. But we've seen him talk about comprehension being holy. We we, we know he, he understands. I'm not sure what the word is, but he knows great things. So I come back. I come back again to the, to this to, to David's earlier uh, uh, line about about presence. We we seek presence and we arrive in presence by our various ways. But once we're there, all of our own measures, all of our own sense of 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 our trajectory once we're there changes, because in the presence of Christ, who provides our new measure, we somehow converge beyond ourselves. So we don't idolize a child or an intellectual. So we don't idolize either side. There is no measure to communion. I mean, it just is. Beyond all measure, yeah. Yeah. Good.